قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استوى واستقيم وطراص صد الفرج strain a line shoulder shoulder foot foot close the gaps between you please be mindful of your cell phones place them on silent Allahu Akbar Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Malik Yawm Al-Din إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون نحن أولياؤكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ولكم فيها ما تشتهي أنفسكم ولكم فيها ما تدعون نزلا من غفور رحيم ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين ولا تستوي الحسنة ولا السيئة ادفع بالتي هي أحسن فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه ولي حميم وما يلقاها إلا الذين صبروا وما يلقاها إلا ذو حظ عظيم وإما ينزغنك من الشيطان نزغ فاستعذ بالله إنه هو السميع العليم الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده طيب الله أكبر سبحان سبحان الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين 
الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين ومن آياته الليل والنهار والشمس والقمر لا تسجدوا للشمس ولا للقمر واسجدوا لله واسجدوا لله الذي خلقهن إن كنتم إياه تعبدون فإن استكبروا فالذين عند ربك يسبحون له بالليل والنهار وهم لا يسأمون ومن آياته أنك ترى الأرض خاشعة فإذا فإذا أنزلنا عليها الماء اهتزت وربت إن الذي أحياها لمحي الموتى إنه على كل شيء قدير الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده طيب المبارك الله اكبر الله اكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله اكبر الله اكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا I am so happy alhamdulillah to see so many beautiful faces here tonight alhamdulillah by the grace of Allah azza wa jal we have Ustad Abu Taymiyyah from the UK here to visit MCMC for an event alhamdulillah Inshallah, he should be in the building. He will be coming up shortly. Um, we're just going to pray our sunnah, if we can. And we're going to set up the table right here. So if I can have the brothers here just move off a little bit. Inshallah, after you pray your sunnah. And then for the program, we're going to start with the lecture, inshallah. Followed by the Q&A. Then at 7.45, we have the adhan for Aisha. Then Aisha Iqama, inshallah, will be at 8 o'clock. And we'll adjourn. Inshallah, bi'idhnillah. جزاكم الله خيرا
If everyone can please just move as close and as tight as possible. We have a lot of people that are not even here that are downstairs. Keep moving. All the way, all the way, all the way. This side, keep going. Try not to sit on the wall so more people can fit. space. Keep getting tighter, tighter, tighter. Love your Muslim brother for the sake of Allah. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلي وسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين بعثه الله شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه والسراج المنيرة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته honestly my brothers and my sisters it's really a great pleasure to see all of these glowing faces having attended on a night where you have the Super Bowl. Is it a Super Bowl? I was just learning about American football as we were sitting in the, in the shake shop, whatever you guys call it, the burgers and whatever. And they were explaining everything to me, right? And I heard it's New Jersey playing against Philly, something along the lines of that. So for you to sacrifice the football game in order to attend this program, Allah, brothers and sisters, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choosing you from amongst many. We know that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Man yuridillahu bi khayran yufaqihu fi deen. Whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for, he gives him 
al-fiqh, he gives him understanding in the religion. Which basically means, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want good for that individual, he won't give him that understanding in the religion. So the fact that out of all people he chose you to sit here on this evening while there are so many distractions, and you could have been doing 101 things, especially with work, and also school on tomorrow, right? You could be resting, you could be revising, you could be doing all sorts of things, but you chose to sit here in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to listen to this miskin, to this poor guy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and honor every single one of you. Um, our discussion today, my brothers and my sisters, is about the Muslim identity. The Muslim identity that has been lost in many places. Al-Islam being under attack, and when I mean what I mean by this is an ideological attack. Normative Islam is under an ideological attack. It is constantly being tampered and tainted. The enemies of Islam are always trying their utmost best to distort the pure religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us this over 1400 years ago when he said, لا يأتي زمان إلا الذي بعده شر من. There doesn't come a time except that the time that comes after is better or worse. Worse. That Prophet of Allah, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who was in the middle of a desert, and I shouldn't use the word predicted, but rather accurately with conviction, he told us a number of things which we see unfolding right before our eyes. Also the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us over 1400 years ago, من أشراط الساعة أن From the signs of the hour is that ilm will become scarce, will become more and more strange. Right? The ilm that we are in need of to navigate and maneuver around all of these ideological doubts that a lot of us who go to university have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. The knowledge that we are in need of, my brothers and my sisters, to maneuver and navigate around the different temptations that are ripping us to shreds. Our Iman goes down, and from the common questions that we receive all the time, a brother saying, advise me. I feel spiritually dead and empty. And he doesn't know the next step to take. Al-ilm becomes scarce at the end of time. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling us this, مِنَ الشَّرَاطِ السَّاعَةِ أَنْ يَقِلَّ الْعِلْمِ وَيَظْهَرَ الْجَهَلِ And ignorance will become extremely, extremely prevalent. And he goes on to say, وَيَظْهَرَ الزِّنَا before I move on to the issue of a zina, the ignorance here, my brothers and my sisters, just walk into university. By the way, guys, I call the university a breeding ground for kufr, shirk, fahisha, filth and evil. You have all of the isms there, and it's extremely, extremely colorful there as well, right? A young Muslim who's holding on to his Muslim identity, loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, someone who adheres to Islamic values and morals, walks into this jungle, and excuse me for saying all of this, brother and sisters, I myself went to university, and I'm not telling anyone to drop out of university at all, right, just in case the parents misunderstand what I'm saying. No, I'm not saying that at all. Right, there are a number of challenges that our youth face, when they go to these universities in the UK, approximately three, four weeks ago, I finished a university tour where I went past 27 universities. Not Islamic universities, they were secular universities. I engaged with the youth, sat down with them, and wallahi, brothers and sisters, it's extremely, extremely heartbreaking 
what many of our youngsters are going through. So one starts this university with his Islamic identity and then he runs into a number of doubts. And because he doesn't have the knowledge, he doesn't have the tools to equip himself to repel all of these doubts coming his way, what happens, my brothers and my sisters, he embraces it. And I want to make something very clear, my brothers and my sisters, it's a qa'idah that I hope you guys write down and point out to anyone who's going through these challenges with regards to his religion. Just because you don't have the answers, that doesn't mean there aren't any answers for that which has been posed to you. This is very similar to someone who started med school. He's maybe a second year student. He's not going to have all of the answers that he is maybe asked about, right? Sometimes what happens, you go to med school for a year or two, and everyone back home thinks that this guy is a doctor. Sahih. They start asking questions about medicine. Should I take this? Should I not? Right? And then he says, yeah, he, I'm a miskin. I don't know anything. I've only started, I still haven't graduated. You've accepted now that you don't have the answers for everything pertaining to the speciality that you're trying to learn, right? The same goes when it comes to the different questions you are asked about Al-Islam. And this is the case with the majority who might go to university. They don't have the tools to equip themselves, right? when being asked all of these different questions. These questions that are being posed, they are there to catch you out, to shake your faith to the core, right? One doesn't have the answers, so he embraces whatever is coming his way. Unfortunately, which shouldn't necessarily be the case, right? I've seen some of my sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and keep them firm and steadfast. She starts the university holding on to her religion, steadfast in the deen. But then she runs into all of these feminists. By the way, me and the feminists are having a great time on Twitter. <laughs> I, even though, mashallah, she's observing the Islamic clothing from top to bottom. Right? This ideology is something that you embrace, which hijacks your mind. Agreed? She's still observing the Islamic clothing. However, some of the sentiments, right, that she has now absorbed and embraced may well be sentiments that take her out the fold of Islam. I'm sure you guys have seen videos going around of Speaker's Corner. Huh? When you come to the UK, you shouldn't go there. Huh? <laughs> Speaker's Corner, which is a corner, where people speak, right? Whoever shouts the loudest wins. That's how I look at it. You have any random individual that comes, could be a Muslim, could be a non-Muslim, and they spew out whatever they believe and hold a sentiment. Not so long ago, our brother, you guys know him, right? Ali Dawa. If I drop a name, that doesn't mean I agree with everything that they do and everything that they say. I'm trying to do taqrib of something. He was having a conversation with a sister that wears the hijab. Wallahi alladhi la ilaha ghayru, my brothers and my sisters, my heart began to hurt. An 18 year old, I think she was, was she 18 or 17? The video went viral. Wallahi absolutely destroyed my heart made me feel so sad with all the things that were coming out of her mouth. And the only way she got all of this information, my brothers and my sisters, was her being in that environment, whether it may be a college setting or a university setting, and she embraced all of these doubts. And wallahi, at times, some of the things that were coming out of her mouth were borderline Islam. Flirting with disbelief. Ignorance that we're speaking about has become extremely widespread in the end of times. Here is an example of that. You are made to believe when you go to university that the lens that we should be looking through is 
everything is what? Equal rights. Sahih. Let me ask you guys a question. Did Islam come to establish equal rights or justice? Justice. justice. You tell me now equal rights, my brothers and my sisters. We're going to tell our female folk, our women, right? Even when she becomes pregnant. Actually, take that example out of the way for a moment. Right? To go and work in the sewage, which anyone here... Right? As a man, instruct his daughter or his sister or his wife to go and take a job working for the sewers. Equal rights. Right? Or for her now to start constructing skyscrapers under the scorching heat. Equal rights. Right? She is made to believe that. This is the lens that she looks through. And then after her mind has been hijacked, that everything should be through the lens of equal rights, she comes to the Quran, right? She comes across certain commandments, whether it may be pertaining to inheritance. Have you guys heard of inheritance law? It's very different to what the state might propagate. It's very different in Islam. Allah Azza wa Jal distributes it fairly. Not equally, fairly. And that's very, very important. But because she's been convinced that everything has to be equal, this is not fair. This is unjust. She's saying this about verses of the Quran. When Allah Azza wa Jal said about himself, وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not oppress anyone. So now when you say this is unfair or unjust, can you see how problematic this is? Can you see how dangerous this is? By the way, I'm not saying that anyone has disbelieved or anything like that. But I'm talking to you guys about how scary, right, this process now has become. Right. <clears throat> a brother who recently gave a lecture, was it recent or maybe some time ago, said to me, when he came to the university in my own city, I feel extremely embarrassed having to say this, my city, right? He gave a lecture on feminism. He gave a lecture on feminism, right? The ISOC president, you guys say MSA, right? MSA, which means the Muslim Students Association. We say ISOC, Islamic Association, something like that. After he gave a lecture on feminism, out of all people, the MSA president, who was a female, comes up to him and says, why are you mentioning the bad things about our religion? Why are you mentioning the bad things about our religion? Right? Can you see how the mind has been polluted? How dangerous this is, my brothers and my sisters. Right? Al-Islam came to establish justice. Right? No matter how rich a woman may be, no matter how many hundreds and thousands of pounds she has in her bank account, you as a husband still need to clothe her. Yes, my sisters? Is this equal rights now? Sorry to throw you guys under the bus, guys. Huh? These are manly characteristics that the man, he's the one that provides. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the man authority over the woman. This is mentioned in the Quran, and let me make something very, very clear. I'm not here to express my own views and opinions. Just in case we have someone here that works for the media, right? Fox News or anything else, ready to misconstrue what I'm about to say. I'm just quoting. First Amendment, right? I'll make it very, very clear. I'm not here to incite violence towards anyone, harassment. I spread peace and compassion, right? The point that I was making, my brothers and my sisters, was... What was the point I was making? Naam. Allah Azza wa has given a man authority. And sometimes when we look at his term authority, it's completely misunderstood. Right? Some of them think that, oh, he has the right to boss her around, to oppress her. La. That's not what he means. Right? He is there to be by her side, protecting her, maintaining her. If her dignity is on the line, 
It is upon him now to come and protect her. It's not just something that is mustahab, that is recommended for him to do. No, this is mandatory. We're seeing these debates and discussions on the World Wide Web, on social media. One saying, right, if someone breaks into the house, I'm not going to go down. Do we not hear these discussions by these YouTubers? She's on her own. He's going to stay in the room and he's going to let her go to the door downstairs. Right? Even if she's your, not your wife, right? I don't want to go into too many uh, intricate details. It's upon that man now to go and protect that woman. Right? And also because he spends on her, which is his duty, Allah Azza wa Jal has given authority to the man. Right? Firstly, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preferred him in this regard, and likewise because he spends on her. This is all, by the way, brothers and sisters, normative Islam. Right? I'm not here bringing anything out of my own back pocket. However, she is given a very different explanation of what this ayah means. Comes and denies it. Completely eliminates it. Right? That's very, very dangerous. And that is because, my brothers and my sisters, due to the ignorance that has become so widespread and prevalent, which has led one now to being on the verge of his religion. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, وَيَظْهَرَ zina." Also, zina becomes extremely widespread. I don't think I need to spell that out, right? A zina becomes extremely widespread. Once upon a time, I remember my brothers and my sisters, if a sister became impregnated outside of wedlock, it would be a big deal on the street. Did you guys ever live in a time like that? She became impregnated outside of marriage, with carrying out this major sin, it would be a big deal. Oh, subhanAllah, how could this happen? This is a problem, right? However, now, if it, if it happens, oh, wallahi, so-and-so done it. It's not a big deal. Because of how widespread it became. وَيَكْثُرُ الْحَرْجِ The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, killings become what? Extremely widespread. Again, I don't need to spell that out to you guys. You guys live in America. I'm from the UK. Huh? It's more prevalent here than it is in the UK, guys, right? Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this while he was situated in the middle of a desert. Sometimes... A way that one can maybe increase the faith of another is going through the signs of prophecy. Right? Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said so many things even though he was in between, right? Mountains. He was in a desert. How could he have said with so much conviction that such and such a thing is going to happen and it happened just as he mentioned it? Right? I was going to mention hadith, but I'm sure you guys have come across the greenery that has begun to appear in the deserts of Saudi Arabia, right? Everyone's getting scared. Oh, huh? The Dajjal's around the corner, right? Can the Messiah said this over 1400 years ago? When we go through these hadith that are maybe from the signs of the end of times, because I know normally when you announce that a lecture will be delivered on this particular topic, the message is full. People are extremely intrigued to all the signs of the hour, the minor and the major. Sahih. What is the objective behind delivering a lecture on this particular issue? So my brothers and my sisters, we can awaken from our deep sleep, our intoxication, right? Not for us to just have a little buzz, feel good about ourselves, oh wow, this is all happening but to actually get productive, right? To do something about ourselves, right? And the other reason is to increase the faith of those who may doubt the truthfulness of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said another hadith, and I think it's important to mention. بَادِرُوا بِالْعَمَالِ فِتَنًا كَقِطَعِ اللَّيْلِ الْمُظْلِمِ يُصْبِحُ الْإِنسَانُ مُؤْمِنًا وَيُمْسِي كَافِرًا Hasten to doing good deeds. The fitan, the different trials and tribulations that you see 
are like the dark patches of the night. What happens, my brothers and my sisters, if you go camping and there's no torch, right? And you're in the middle of a forest. It's time to move. And you've got everyone around you. They're going to be holding on to one another. They move a little bit, they might trip over because they don't have a light. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam likened the dark patches of the night, right? To the fitan, the trials and tribulations when it comes your way, you may well find yourself tripping up, not knowing what direction to go in. Right. So we are being told, bad bil do righteous deeds. And you cannot expect to do righteous deeds accordingly except with knowledge. Can you see how all of this huh, comes back to one important aspect, which is what? Seeking knowledge. Learning about our religion. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, يُصْبِحُ الْإِنسَانُ مُؤْمِنًا وَيُمْسِي كَافِرًا وَيُمْسِي الْإِنسَانُ مُؤْمِنًا وَيُصْبِحُ كَافِرًا يَبِيعُ دِينَهُ بِعَرَضٍ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وفي رواية خليل one, way, one may wake up in the morning and he is what? A believer. And then by the night he has disbelieved. Subhanallah. That quickly. The morning was a Muslim and then by the night he has disbelieved. وَيُمْسِي الْإِنسَانُ مُؤْمِنًا وَيُصْبِحُ كَافِرًا it may well be that the night enters and he is in the state of Iman. He has his faith and then by the morning he has disbelieved. Well, I used to look at this hadith maybe over 10 years ago and think to myself, okay, the night has entered and by the morning he's, the, he's a disbeliever. Ah, that is all before the social media era. Right? That is all before the social media era. Once upon a time, my brothers and my sisters, if you wanted to surface the internet, you would have to go to your living room, sah? You had that big Dell computer with the big back. Say, Whatever you're surfacing or accessing, right, you'd be watching the door at the same time. Is anybody watching? Nobody in their right mind would take that big computer and put it on this blanket, right? Now life has become so much more easier. We have these phones under the blanket. Nobody can see what you are doing. One of our mashayikh, professors in the university. His name is Sheikh Abdul Qadir Ata Sufi. That's his name. I was reading when I was preparing for my masters on Aqidah. I was reading some of his books, subhanAllah. Something that he mentioned right at the beginning which really, really touched me was once upon a time we would tell the professors when the student comes from different parts of the world to the University of Al-Medina, right? Because you know, students come from all over the world, right? To Al-Medina, to study there. You have 500,000 applicants every year and only 3,000 get accepted. So you have a couple from here and a couple from there that all come to university to study. Sorry. So the professor said, we will tell the people, don't, or the, the, the teachers and the professors, don't expose, for example, this Pakistani, or this Kenyan, or this Indonesian, the doubts that he may well never ever come across. Don't. There's no need. If he has certain doubts that he's suffering from, just answer these doubts and then let him go back to his country. Don't start exposing them to things that may well never ever cross their minds. Up until social media came about. And he says, well, the whole world has become like a small little village. The whole world has become like a small little village. Agreed? Right. A small little village. Where you can just about access anything you want. These hashtags that we have on Twitter. Huh? Once you click on it, it takes you into a completely different world. Agreed? Especially when you click on them colorful ones. huh? Now it makes a lot of sense. So one can leave the religion so quickly. And then the Messenger of Allah, as I mentioned right there, he sells his religion for a small price. You guys want to hear what's even more shocking? And again, I'm just quoting. I'm not here to express my own views and ideas. The Messenger of Allah said, That which I fear the most from my ummah is the practices of the people of Lot. He said this 1400 years ago, my brothers and my sisters. Now look at how the world has become. 
This is what our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned over 1400 years ago. As you can see, my brothers and my sisters, as he, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned, لَيَأْتِي عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانٌ أَلْقَابِذُ عَلَى دِينِهِ كَالْقَابِذُ عَلَى الْجَمَرِ Where holding on to your religion will become like holding on to hot coal. There's an ideological attack from every direction. Right? From every single direction. And a lot of us are struggling with it. Right? It is tearing us to shreds. And I'm sure a lot of us here, my brothers and my sisters, are sick and tired of constantly feeling sorry for ourselves. With what we keep seeing, right, occurring with our youngsters. Not so long ago, I received a phone call from a brother. I think I mentioned this in West Orange earlier as well. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I'm losing track. Got a phone call. And the brother is saying that his sister has become an atheist. And you know the parent doesn't want to do anything about it. You know why? Because what is more concerning to the parent is, what is more concerning to the parent is, this child of theirs, this teenager, or this 20 year old, however, whatever the age is, right, is focused on their university. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to open a discussion now that may well lead a back and forth, right? A disruption in her studies, right? Let me ask you all a question, my brothers and my sisters. And I say that as someone who studies civil engineering, right? If I go through the years of university, graduating with a degree, however, I have lost my religion in the process. How is that shahada going to benefit me the moment I depart from this world? And I'll make this very clear. I'm not saying that university is not important. I'm not saying that at all. Right? I've seen right, enough things happening in university. There's two reasons why I personally ended up leaving the university. One of them is, of course, I got accepted at the University of Medina. I had to make a decision. It's a no-brainer. And the second reason was, I would see people like me and you roaming around university campus learning my religion. And then they would target vulnerable Muslims. They would target vulnerable Muslims who were shaky in their faith. And they would start posing questions at them. Up until they became extremely overwhelmed and they had no answers. And it absolutely destroyed them spiritually. This is what we're dealing with, my brothers and my sisters. Right? This is what we are dealing with. So today, inshallah ta'ala, my brothers and my sisters, I want to go through some points. How long do I have? Huh? Hour and a half. We're living in a time and age where the millennials are used to snippets. I recently found an article, right? It said that the average attention span for the millennials is 13 minutes. But then when I looked at the date, it was written maybe, what, seven, eight years ago? So imagine what the attention span of the millennial is now, especially with the emergence of TikTok and Instagram, Fitnagram, sorry. Yeah. Um, going back to the point that I was making my brothers and my sisters I want to go through some points that disrupts our Islamic identity what we first need to understand my brothers and my sisters is that Iblis has a plan he has a plan to alter and change. He swore, and it's mentioned in the Quran, فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Iblis said, just as you expelled me now from Jannah, you threw me out, right? You destroyed me, O oh Allah. I am going to sit in between them and also the Sirat al-Mustaqim, the right path, Sahih. 
is what we ask Allah Azza wa Jal every day to keep us firm on, right? إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ By the way, guys, we're, just not, we're not going to go on for another hour and a half. <coughs> Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma and also Abdullah Mas'ud, they commented on this, about the straight path, or what is he actually going to try and block? Because he's saying here he's going to sit in between you and also the straight path. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he said, الدين الواضح, the clear religion. He's going to make sure that the clear religion of Allah Azza wa Jal is distorted, is tampered with. And Allah says, ثم لا أتينهم, quoting Iblis, ثم لا أتينهم من بين أيديهم ومن خلفهم وعن أيمانهم وعن شمائلهم ولا تجد أكثرهم شاكرين. Then I'm going to come from four directions. I'm going to come from four directions. What were the four directions? Min bayni aydim from the front. Wa min khalfim also from the back. Wa an aymanihim from the right and also from the left. Abdullah ibn Abbas he commented what this means from the front. Ushakikhum fi akhiratim. I'm going to give them doubts about the hereafter. You walk into philosophy class. Anyway, study philosophy. Actually, don't put your hand up. Huh? You walk into philosophy class, and I have individuals who I personally know that are studying philosophy. When I made mention of this in the university tour that I gave, a lot of them began to rethink and reconsider what they study. That professor does not care whether you're a Muslim or you're a Christian or you're a Jew. If you are a person of religiosity, he is going to try and rip your religion away from you. Up until you, have, you start having doubts about the hereafter, about your existence, about the ma'ad, about the return, and so on and so forth, being resurrected. Then we were told, Also, Iblis, my brothers and my sisters, is going to come from the back. Right? You know what he said? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, what this means? I'll make them love the dunya. Right? I will make them love the dunya. Let me make something clear. There's no harm taking from the dunya that which is going to aid and assist you hereafter. Even Allah said in the Quran, Wala tansa min dunya. Don't forget your fair share of the dunya. Ibn Kathiri said, Min al mashrubati wal ma'kulati wal umur al mabaha. From the food and the drink and the things that are permissible. To the point, you forget why you have been created. You wake up in the morning and the only thing you're thinking about is what? How I can increase the numbers of my bank account. Hmm? Up until Allah becomes secondary in your life. When I find time, that's when I'm going to worship Allah. Billahi alayk ya brothers and sisters. Is that fair? Right? I wake up in the morning memorizing the periodic table C2O, H2O. Huh? Pythagoras theorem. It's mashallah and that. Right? Alliteration, condensation, evaporation. Huh? And all of the other shations out there. We've memorized it inside out. This is what our main focus is. And we forgot about Allah Azza wa Jal. And then he said, وَعَنَا imanihim." He's also going to come from that right. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he said, Ushabbihu alayhim amra deenihim. I'm going to give them doubts about their religion. I'm going to give them doubts about their religion. And I don't need to spell that out, brothers and sisters. I've already touched on it. And then he's also going to come from the left. السيئات يحثهم عليها ويأمرهم بها right? ويزينها في عيونهم Evil, he's going to encourage you. He's going to push you towards it and he will also try to beautify it in your eyes. You know, sometimes we make excuses for ourselves, right? Well, it's a sin, but you know, مصلحة, مصلحة. Huh? There's some benefit in it and making 101 excuses for ourselves. Up until it ends up destroying us. These sins, a lot of people think that you only have to answer to Allah when you meet Him on Yom Al Qiyamah. A lot of people think that. 
right? And they don't realize there are almost immediate consequences, immediate consequences. The problems that we might end up going through on a day-to-day -day basis, sins affect our relationships with our parents, with our wives, our spouses. It affects our provision. Islam is so perfect, my brothers and my sisters. Right? This is what he has set out to do, and then we are told in the Quran how he is there to alter two things. For the sake of time, Iblis has set out to alter two things. Number one, your outer appearance and also your fitrah, your natural disposition. He has gone out to alter these two things. Right? And I'm going to, inshallah ta'ala, explain to you guys how one ends up losing his Islamic identity. And I ask everyone here to fear Allah. Not to start looking at brothers, oh, he's probably talking about him. Fear Allah, Azawajal. We are all at different stages of our journey. We are all still learning. Some who may have turned up today, it may well be their first visit to a masjid this year. Right? They are looking for something to kickstart their journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't be judgmental. Number one, my brothers and my sisters, from that which rips your Islamic identity to shreds, resembling a group of people from the outside. And I'm going to show you guys how this ends up affecting your conduct and eventually your belief. Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi says, Al-Musharaka fil hadiyya al-zahir turithu tanasuban wa tashakulan bayna al-mutshabihayn. Yaqudu ila muafaqadi ma fil akhlaqi wal amal. He says, resembling a group of people from the outside, right, in the outward things, even the little things that we copy, right, leads to blending in and resembling them in their etiquettes. And then he gives a couple of examples. One of the examples that he gives is, you know, a young child now, if you buy him soldier or army clothes, what's the first thing the child's going to do? Huh? He's going to start resembling the soldier. He's going to start doing this. Huh? Sahih? I'm talking about maybe a five-year-old, six-year-old. You give him army clothes, he's going to start behaving like a soldier. Agreed? A young child that you now clothe with a hijab and abaya, what's one of the first things that she might be doing? She might start doing? She starts making dua, starts praying. Kids as young as one and a half years of age, they pray. Did you guys know that? Wallahi al -azim. I witness it and I see it. As young as one and a half years of age, they start praying. Right? And sometimes because they've been now clothed, they watch, right, their parents, for example, she might see the mother wearing a hijab, or she might see her dad wearing a hijab as well, right? Huh? The moment she gets the prayer mat out, the mother, she puts the hijab on, the child sees that, when the hijab is put, she goes and gravitates towards the prayer mat. You begin to feel a sense of belonging towards those people that you have now imitated. Right? If I'm dressed like this, my brothers and my sisters, huh? and I start maybe hanging around with drug dealers, you think I'm going to blend in? Are they going to be comfortable around me? I said this in Philly. They were like, yeah, here in Philly. <laughs> huh? <laughs> huh? They're like, that's normal there. It's not. Right? Shahid min al-kalam. Right? If I start, someone like myself, who dresses like the way I do, I take my clothes off, and I start dressing the way they dress, I will begin to feel a sense of belonging towards them. Sah? Without a shadow of doubt. And it's only a matter of time before I start behaving like them. No offense to anyone who's got the new era cap. You guys, have new, new, you guys know what a new era cap is? When I was on the flight to the, uh, the States, I actually went and put one on. Huh? 
It said LA on there, huh? Unfortunately, you know, I had to take this off. But one thing I will say to you guys is the moment you start wearing a type of clothing, it makes you feel a certain way, right? Especially when you start wearing a certain way, right? And then you turn it and you toss it and you flip it and, huh? Or certain types of clothing that rappers are known for. The moment you put it on, it's only a matter of time before you start walking like them. Sahih? And this is the point that he's trying to make. The moment you start resembling a certain people, it's only a matter of time before you start behaving like them. And when you start behaving like them, you begin to adopt the beliefs that they carry. This is the point that Ibn Taymi rahmatullahi was mentioning in his kitab, Iqtidah al-Sarat al mustaqim And it's very, very true. Right? Sometimes we're made to feel that, right, we have to fit in. And I'm not saying that there can't be any community cohesion or whatever have you. La. Islam is not against that. But to the point where we end up compromising our religion. Just so we could be accepted by the non-Muslims, for example. I <clears throat> Start dressing like them, you'll see yourself behaving like them. And it's only a matter of time before you end up believing what they believe. Someone may ask the question, but Akhi, you know, it's just clothes and whatever have you. The question you really need to pose to yourself is, right, what am I doing this for? Right, what am I actually doing this for? Am I doing it just because they are general clothes? And by the way, I'm not saying that you can't wear trousers, you can't wear a shirt, I never said that. It's Adi, love us, no problem. But sometimes we do something and there is a particular intention behind it. I, it is because I'm trying to be like so-and-so. Eh? This is more than just a, oh, is it permissible, is it not? Allah Azza wa Jal in those verses, wa What did he say at the end? وَمَنْ يَتَّخِذِ الشَّيْطَانَ وَلِيَّ Whoever takes the shaytan as what? As a wali. As a supporter. Right? As an alliance, this person has indeed gone far, far astray and is at loss. Right? Taking the shaitan as a wali. And he is there trying to change your outer appearance. Just so then it could lead to the second altering that he really, really wants and that is to change your natural disposition. Number two, my brothers and my sisters, and then there's a number three and then we'll stop there inshallah ta'ala. Number two, that which destroys our Islamic identity, my brothers and my sisters, is what we look at. You know, once upon a time, once upon a time, a parent would say, Alhamdulillah, my child's at home, he or she, or they, right, <laughs> is not hanging around with drug dealers, It's not hanging around with those who go clubbing, Alhamdulillah, my child's at home, sahih. We would think that the only way, the only way that one would get corrupted is by them hanging around with the wrong crowd. That was the only way, the only way that we thought would corrupt our children. Alhamdulillah, as long as he's home, everything is great, which is true at the time. However, we can wave goodbye to those days where we thought the only way that the child would become corrupted is by them hanging around with the wrong crowd. However, now, my brothers and my sisters, the child may be in between those four walls. And we've handed over these gadgets to them. And they are then exposed to a whole different world. Agreed? They're exposed to a whole different world. You know, auntie one time called me and she said, I want you to speak to my daughter. I was like, okay, what's up? She's asking me, she's asking me to buy her a mini skirt. I don't know what a mini skirt is. Don't look at it. Huh? <laughs> the auntie's saying, I don't, I've never wore it. Her sisters don't wear it. But all of a sudden now my child is asking me to wear a mini skirt outside. 
What do you think the root cause was? Sitting on TikTok all day, just scrolling, 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 seeing all of these fasiqat and fajirat, right? Because TikTok is one of those apps that's been created, right? It's a music app. For you to record yourself wriggling yourself and shaking your body while music is playing in the background. You'll find even maybe a 60-year-old guy wearing all types of weird clothes, right? And then shaking himself. All right? So this young child is constantly scrolling and watching this. I have a principle. What the eyes can't see, the heart won't desire. What the eyes can't see, the heart won't desire, my beloved brothers and sisters. Right? الراغب الأصفهاني he mentioned ليس إعداء الجليس لجليسه بمقالة أو فعالة فقط بل من نظر أيضا you don't just become influenced by the people you hang around with or by hearing certain things no he said also by looking it affects you it influences the way you think and the way you behave you know some of the scholars of the past they would say you shouldn't look at someone who's lazy let me ask you guys a question is it haram to look at a lazy person do you get a sin if I look at someone who's just uh, uh, Huh? He's just all day at home. I think you guys have a name for it as well, right? Doesn't want to get up, expecting his wife to work, right? By the way, my sisters, you, you guys always message saying, what are some of the characteristics that I should look out for to be a red flag? This is one of them. Huh? Expecting his wife to pay for the expenses at home while he sits at home watching, what's it called, NFL? Huh? <laughs> He expects his wife to bring the money home, and so on and so forth. Anyways, the point that I was making is, looking at a lazy person, the scholars will say, don't do so. Because subconsciously you will see it creeping in, and then all of a sudden you see yourself behaving like that. Let alone that which is haram. Let alone that which is haram. All right. Shall I tell you guys something else that has corrupted some of our sisters? Looking at some of these female YouTubers, right, who would do all these tutorials and whatever have you, who would dress a certain way, they put layers after layers on their face, that she's completely lost, the way she actually looks naturally, up until she ends up taking off a hijab. I don't need to spell this out to you guys. We've seen enough, and I'm sure the sisters know what I'm talking about. Huh? Constantly looking and staring and Huh? Gorging at these girls that are teaching you how to dress this and then that and then do this, put this on your eyes, put this on your face. And then she begins to desire that. And eventually ends up causing problems between her and her husband. Because she ends up dressing better outside than she does inside of the house. And then some of these female YouTubers, they end up taking off the hijab. And she goes, Wallahi, I uh, make dua for me. <laughs> Wallahi al-Azim, guys. I don't see you guys are laughing. But yeah, make dua for me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm on that spiritual journey, you know. <clears throat> this YouTuber became affected by looking at all these other female non-Muslim YouTubers. These girls are being affected by looking at this female YouTuber that they look as a role model too, right? When she takes off a hijab, all of them all of a sudden now are on that spiritual journey as well. Make dua for us. What do they all start with, my brothers and my sisters? Hey, look. Sahih. Staring. It influenced them in so many different ways. Right? Especially in today's day and age. Even a guy, right? He starts imitating this guy with rainbow hair and rainbow teeth, right? He constantly keeps looking at him. What's his name? 6'5", right? 6'5", <laughs> yeah? right? 6'9", sorry, sorry. 6'9". And then all of a sudden, he wants to have rainbow hair and rainbow teeth. He's a rapper, right? You've been watching him, watching, watching, and you see yourself walking a certain way. It all started with a look. Agreed, my brothers and my sisters? Is that Aisha? Okay. <laughs>
We're not done anyway, inshallah. Can someone switch their off? Okay, طيب. Does that make sense, my brothers and my sisters? Number three is the people that we hang around with. The people that we constantly hang around with. You know, sometimes my brothers and my sisters, we feel as if, oh, he's my close friend. Right? I can't do without him. He's been with me from day one. Right? He's affecting you in your religion. I think even in the other message, somebody asked this question, right? Well, like Captain Mustafa? Yeah. Someone asked this question. He goes, he has two friends. One of them is a non-Muslim and one of them is a Muslim. The Muslim one is giving him a lot of issues. It's troublesome. My brothers and my sisters, we have to learn to say no. Right? We have to learn to say no. Whether you're old, whether you're young, we're seeing people who are old in age because of the people they hang around with, they start chewing khat. Have you guys, have you guys come to know what khat is? It's very common in places like Yemen and also in Somalia. Right? The green thing that they chew. In where I live, you know, in that locality, you had old men that were family men, but they had started hanging around these guys and they started chewing khat. Just to show you, it's not just young people that this happens to. The elders, they get influenced as well. If we don't learn to say no. Likewise, my brothers and my sisters, you walk into university, no matter how they are dressed, don't be deceived, right? Don't judge a book by its cover. I'm using it in a different way, guys. Huh? You see that individual, mashallah, looking wonderful? That sister is dressed, you know, Islamically from top to bottom. And then she ends up affecting your mindset because of the pollution that got stuck in her brain. And then you see that which I mentioned earlier. Right? This feminist ideology uh, that causes her to be borderline because she's rejecting verses in the Quran saying it's unfair and unjust. Hmm? Because she's saying it's unfair and unjust. And that is because who we are hanging around with. Right? My brothers and my sisters, I want you all, and I said this, I think in just about every lecture, because I have a mission to accomplish. And that is to bring to everyone's attention why we are suffering so badly. Why we as Muslims feel like a minority, even though subhanAllah that's not necessarily the case. We feel like a minority though. Right? Look at the rainbow team. Well, my brothers, be serious. This is a very, very important point. I, and again, I'm not inciting violence or harassment towards anyone. Look how powerful and strong they are. Even though they are a minority within, within, within a minority compared to everyone else. Sah? You go online, they appear as if they are the majority. Even though they are like a raindrop that has fallen into an ocean compared to everyone else. Sahih? Why is that in the UK, the zebra crossing? You know, it's meant to be black and white. You guys got zebra crossings there, right? Huh? It's black and white. Over there now, it's rainbow colors. You walk into, you know, you find flags everywhere. They have rights that they've acquired because of their unity and their togetherness, sahih? But when it comes to us, we've been made to feel as if we can't propagate our basic morals and values. You know why they come across extremely powerful and strong, my brothers and my sisters? Because they are all actively involved. You click on one of those hashtags, which I'm, don't, don't do, right? And they come across as if there are so many, right? Bidun haya wala taraddud, no hesitation, right? SubhanAllah, right? Openly and actively marching the streets, and this is all being documented. Pictures are being taken and uploaded onto the internet. They've taken over the WWW, guys. 
Do you know what that stands for? The World Wide Web, for those who didn't know. However, in comparison to the Muslims, jamming tactics are used to silence us, to make us feel that we can't even teach our children basic morals and values. Right? And it all starts with somewhere, and that is us educating ourselves with Islamic knowledge. And if we don't, my brothers and my sisters, don't be surprised tomorrow, and it's already happening, when Muhammad and Fatima, my daughter, and my son wake up and they say, Dad, I don't know which pronoun to use. It's serious, guys. I gave a lecture on Christmas huh? a couple of weeks ago. I was speaking about the Islamic identity. I said right at the end, don't be surprised tomorrow if your child is walking into the house of a Christmas tree. He's holding it. And you're saying, Muhammad, what are you doing? And he was like, what, Dad? What's the problem? And I simply because he doesn't know. No one educated him. No one enlightened him. And it shouldn't be surprising. Sometimes what happens is, one is taken to these jungles, right? These breeding grounds for all types of shirk and kufr and isms and, you know, fahisha, these universities, right? That's breeding all this stuff, right? And then the child comes home confused. He asks questions to his father, and the father gets angry. You know what the father also does? He gets a, a sheikh to come over to read Quran on him. He says, my son's probably got a jinn. No, he doesn't. He doesn't have a jinn. He just simply does not know. He's been exposed to all of these doubts, and now he's asking these questions. It's as simple as that. Right? Because he wasn't educated. There was even, subhanAllah, a video that I saw. Right? A brother who was a Muslim. And Wallah said the exact same thing. He said when he came home and he wanted to change his gender and whatever have you, they took him into the attic and they started whipping him. And then they brought the sheikh to read Quran on him. Right? These are the challenges that we're facing, my brothers and my sisters. And the way we're going to be able to maneuver and navigate around that which I've mentioned, all these doubts and challenges, is beneficial knowledge, my brothers and my sisters. Educate yourself now, not to only save yourself, but to save the next generation and the generation after that. Is it fair, guys, that we give so much time to all of these different sciences that we learn, but then when it comes to Islam, we can't? We can't give a bit of time every day. A lot of people think that you only study the deen if you want to become the next big sheikh that gives khutbahs here. Only then you start seeking on. No brothers and sisters. Every day you learn a little bit. Right? Raindrops turn into a sea. And all are in, you know, in a matter of time you'll see yourself encompassing, subhanAllah, that which is extremely beneficial. Does that make sense? Right? Otherwise, guys, like I said, don't be surprised tomorrow. Today we've gone through how the shaitan operates and what he's trying to alter. Now you tell me whether his plan is in full swing or not with everything that we've mentioned. And we are suffering, right? Intellectually challenged, not realizing okay, where it's all coming from. I just want to take a moment out to thank the administration of the masjid. May Allah Azza wa Jalla bless them. All right. For a hot moment, I thought some of the things that were going around would actually get to the administration. Someone apparently said that I say sports are haram. One of the mashayikh in Sheikh Tahir received a message from a brother saying, oh, we've been told not to attend the lecture because Abu Taymiyyah says playing sports is haram. We started cracking up inside of that room that we were in. I was like, Sheikh, I'm a baller myself. Huh? <laughs> right? So you always have that guy who's running his mouth, huh? Who's running his mouth that says, oh, come, let me show you how to play football, right? No, sorry, soccer. <laughs> not that beating people up on the pitch, yani. I'm not talking about that, right? I even sent the Sheikh a video of me not megging, going in and then coming back out, huh? I was like, Sheikh, send it to him. 
all sorts of things that were being mentioned, right? And the fact that the Masjid Jazahum Lakhir, right, didn't, you know, just take some of these things that were, people were saying to make me look like I'm some weirdo, right? Or off the hook, huh? Jazakum Lakhir, Barakallah Fikum, right? Today we spoke about in Masjid Ashab al Yameen 10 points that keeps the community together and strong. One of the things that we touched on was verifying information, being fair and just. To just double checking, right? Just inquiring at times. To just realize, is that really the case or not? Having a discussion, opening up a dialogue. Instead of walking away with preconceived notions. This is why I personally make dua for people who actually come to me and say, did you say this, did you not? Because people will say a lot of things, right? I used to shoot hoops as well, guys. Huh? Three pointers. <laughs> I think if there's any questions, we'll take it now, inshallah ta'ala. Honestly, well, I, from the bottom of my heart, everyone that organized the Sheikh Ibrahim al Huri has a relationship with the masjid, and they were, you know, so nice to facilitate this program. Look at all the khair, alhamdulillah, to see all these wonderful, glowing faces in the house of Allah, at a time when the NFL is taking place, right? May Allah bless you all. Jazakum Allah khair. Tfaddal. Sheikh trying to get me shot here. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Go on. The main thing is just that uh, sometimes when brothers ask, you know, do you know females who are going to get married? They put a condition saying that I want somebody working, I want to make sure that, you know, they can earn that money. Can you touch on this topic? And if you could shed some light on what exactly the is talking about and how the scholars they expand the So, our brother. Should we, should we mute it for a moment? <laughs> Our brother, he said, what's the correct understanding when it comes to the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal? وَقَرْنَا فِي بُيُوتِ كُنَّا وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَا تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ الْأُولَىٰ Allah Azza wa Jal in this verse has mentioned that women, women should adhere to their homes. And they shouldn't display themselves like they used to in Al-Jahiliya. What does he mean? That's what he's asking me. And he said that some brothers, some brothers, he said the brothers, right? They stipulate that a woman has to be working. Like brothers and sisters, that's really not a manly characteristic. As we mentioned, my sisters, I told you guys about your rights. Now you know. Huh? Add it to the memo. And the man, this is a big red flag. The moment he says to you, you have to be working, this is a big red flag. It shows... That he's not a person who's ready to take up his duties as a male Muslim. I'm not saying that they can't help one another. If they want to help one another, great. But expecting her or forcing it upon her that she pays towards the expenses of the home. This, my brothers and my sisters, is a big red flag. My sister, you should be a queen at home being... huh? Being serviced. He's at your service. You need something, he's there. He's going to provide you for it, inshallah ta'ala. Or provide you with it. Do you guys feel like I'm... Uh... Anyone here got any issues with what I said? Huh? I'm seeing very, very like stern faces. Huh? <laughs> and with regards to a woman, my brothers and my sisters, as Allah told us, that a woman should be adhering to her home. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, مَا تَعَبَّدَتِ اللَّهَ إِمْرَأَةٌ بِمِثْلِ تَقْوَى اللَّهِ وَجُلُوسِهَا فِي بَيْتِهَا A woman has not worshipped Allah Azza wa Jal in a way that is better than her coming with a taqwa, being conscious of Allah, and her staying inside of her home. It's actually ibadah. Right? It's actually ibadah for a woman to stick to her house. It's ibadah. Of course, no one is saying that she can't go out. You know, there's a need. She goes out, visits family, whatever have you. However, thinking that the asal, 
right, that the base origin is for her to go out and spend the majority of her day outside of the house and inside. This is the kind of, you know, mindset that some may have. Does that make sense? Let me read something out to you guys now that you've opened this discussion. I'm saving it for Minnesota. I've been told in Minnesota they have a big problem with feminism and also liberalism. What I'm about to read, my brothers and my sisters, is like the New York Post or the Washington Post. It's big, right? We have an equivalent of that in the UK called the Daily Mail. Have you guys heard of it? Oh, wow. You guys heard of it? Ajib. Huh? Look what this article states. Did the feminists burn their bras for nothing? Majority of British women would pick being a housewife over having a career. They make us feel that a woman must have a career and this is the way forward and this is being progressive and whatever have you, right? And you being told to maybe look after your children to be a housewife or to be a mother is something that is what? Oppressive? Huh? That you're being what? Your, your uh, what's the word that I'm looking for, right? Your, um, your potential is going to waste. Sahih? Your potential is going to waste. These are British women. This is not Muslims, guys. Go do your research if you want of what I'm about to read out. Don't worry, guys, I got you. <laughs> this is the statistics that they concluded with. Women aged 25 plus in a relationship and full-time jobs were polled. And they were asked. 62% admitted they secretly wished to be a housewife. 62%. By the way, this is not the Butame. Again, I'm just quoting. Nobody walk out of here call me, calling me a misogynist. I haven't said anything from my own back pocket. I told you I spread compassion and peace, guys. 74% said they felt pressure from other women to be independent. Allahu Akbar. 78% said they wouldn't mind being financially dependent on their partner. You know, brothers and sisters, I found an official US document with some very astonishing verdicts. The document was called United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women. By the way, Zakallah khair for asking that question. Have you guys heard of the feminist writer? She's one of the founding mothers of feminism. Her name is Simone de Beauvoir. Have you guys heard of her? No. Come on, guys. <laughs> Come on, guys. She's one of the founding mothers. She's a French feminist writer. Simone de Beauvoir. Tell you, have you guys heard of Betty Friedan? Half, half, because she was an American writer, right? Who, again, is considered one of the founding mothers of feminism. Betty Friedan, the feminist, interviews Simone de Beauvoir, the feminist. This is when France and the USA come together. Hmm? Simone de Beauvoir is being asked, should women be given the choice to stay at home? Look what she says, no. We don't believe that any women should have this choice. No woman should be authorized to stay at home to raise her children. Society should be totally different. Women should have that choice precisely because, or shouldn't have that choice precisely because, if there is such choice, too many women will make that choice. These are the two huh, flag bearers of feminism. What we need to understand, my beloved brothers and sisters, is that huh, there is an agenda. There is an agenda. Let me read out what Rockefeller one time said. Have you guys heard of David Rockefeller? Yes. The Rockefeller, the Rockefeller family is an American industrial, political, and banking family that owns one of the world's largest fortunes. I one time said this in a video, a clip went viral. People were like, oh, we got another conspiracist on the block. By the way, I've got the video. I've actually got a video of his brother saying the exact same thing. But I haven't released it because it's got music playing in the background. So just in case anyone wants to discredit what I'm saying. David Rockefeller says, 
We started and funded the women's movement so we could tax both sexes. That way, we could put women to work and take their children to indoctrinate. Right? That child, my brothers and my sisters, needs its mother. Sometimes we look at being a housewife and a mother as something that is what? Ah, garbage. I can't fulfill my potential. I'm being deprived. My brothers and my sisters, have we heard the statement before behind every successful man is a? Is a man, huh? It's a woman. <laughs> behind every successful man is a woman. Have you guys heard of Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi? Who was the one that would take him in the mornings? His mother. And Imam Malik, rahmatullahi alayhi, would be waken up, woken up by his mother in the morning. She would put an imama across his head, right? And then she would say to him, go and take knowledge from Rabi'ah. You guys heard Ibn Taymiyyah? Not Abu Taymiyyah, Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah, what's his name? Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim. Tayyib, where did this Taymiyyah come from? By the way, I've called my daughter Taymiyyah. It's a woman's name. Him, his father, and his grandfather, they all became known by this name, Taymiyyah. His great-grandmother, she was a wa'idah. She was a righteous woman who used to give da'wah. Right? She used to give reminders that were inspiring. The whole family became known by this name, Taymiyyah. Right? They say also about the Imam Abu Hanifa, for those who came to the lecture today in New Jersey, what was the thing that I mentioned by Imam Abu Hanifa? Huh, tfadl. The brother said if anyone dissed him, he would send gifts to him. I didn't use the word diss, but... Um, huh? <laughs> if anyone gave him a hard time, right? Imam Abu Hanifa, look at the aql that he had. He could have taken it personally. And I mentioned before that sometimes we think Allah may raise a person just because of knowledge. No. Sometimes there are other, right, spiritual acts that nobody knows about that makes him different from the rest of those who have a lot of knowledge. Can we send gifts there? Anyways, as a side point, Imam Abu Hanifa likewise. Behind every successful man is a woman. You're bringing out the next generation of men, right, of men, brothers and sisters, right, the generations are only getting worse and worse and worse, some have put it down to women thinking, look, I need to be outside of the house, let someone else, huh, bring the child up, and then he comes out extremely wobbly, Dave, someone may say, what about the father, Akhi, the father has to go and work, this is the role that Allah gave him. And that's the role that Allah gave you. And these two roles, they complement one another. It's not a battle, a competition between this guy and her and whoever. No, they complement one another. And the quicker we realize that it's not a battle and competition, the better our families may turn out to be. <sighs> Captain Mustafa. By the way, Captain Mustafa, he helped put... The other program together in New Jersey, may Allah Azza wa Jal bless him. Put a lot of work into, you know, me coming over to New Jersey. So may Allah reward him for that. For that Sheikh. Extremism. Okay. We see from our side of the fence, and, and maybe this is 51% of the people might agree with me, that we see from your side of the fence that your youth are more inclined to blowing up and tying themselves up and, and, and killing people. Me? Our side of the fence. Me doing that? No. Huh. Okay, the youth. Like I told you about the girl that was standing next to you when I saw you on the uh, thing and she yelled out, I'm not my day! Oh, yes. hmm. Well, here, on our side of the fence, we find the photo more so from, from the da'i. And it's spread so wide. 
طيب so I think what uh, Uncle Mustafa is saying here is you have two extremes. A lot of the time that which is spoken about is one type of extremism, like for example blowing yourself up, which of course is haram, right? These type of extremism that we hear about of joining so and so group abroad and this and that, also making takfir of the people unjustly, declaring someone to be a kafir when he's not deserving to be so. This is a very, very dangerous topic and it's one of the types of extremism that we wage war against. He, what I understood from your question, Sheikh, is that you have another type of extremism which is the left, right? You know we've made, we've, we've, what we have been made to feel is that extremism, the moment extremism is mentioned is that side and rightfully so it is. But there's another type of extremism and that is what? Left. Watering down the religion, my brothers and my sisters. And it's as bad as one another. Shaitan doesn't care, as Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned, whether you go right wing or you go left wing. He doesn't care. As long as you stray away from the balanced, the balanced flavor of Islam. We have indeed made you a balanced nation. Whether you go left or whether you go right. right? You had the feminist movement, then you ended up having the Ah, red pill. Both of them are what? As bad as one another. Because they don't hold Islamic values. And some of the things that they say is absolute garbage. When you have one extremism, expect it to breed now the opposite extremism. It's a knee-jerk reaction. This is why my brothers and my sisters, like I said, we have to get actively involved. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayhi, or was Ibn Taymiyyah, he said, وَكُلَّمَا ضَعُفَ مَنْ يَقُومَ بِنُورِ النُّبُوَةِ Right? انتشرت فيهم الفساد والفجور وما إلى ذلك. When those who call to Allah in the correct way become less and less, expect, expect garbage, filth, evil, wickedness to start becoming widespread. We have to take the responsibility upon ourselves. Right? Like I said before, we are sick and tired of constantly feeling sorry for ourselves. This is happening. Our girls are being hijacked by the feminists. She's becoming, he's becoming. Let's do something about it. Let's learn our religion. So we can then propagate and combat and counter both of these extremism that are out there. Especially now you have the left side that's becoming a lot more widespread. Does that make sense? You know. Sorry, Sheikh, for a moment, you, I thought you were saying that I. Uh, I think, I think we need to start asking brothers to write down their questions, right? <laughs> huh. Was it me or the jinn? Eh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that, that's, what, that's really crazy. And the other video you, uh, I listened to was um, about the drug dealer in London who prayed five times, and again, little by little, he was moved away from that life. So again, I just want, I just want to hear your take on Andrew Tate because obviously he's an extremist, but he says a lot of 
What is it you guys are names, huh? <laughs> Dave, guys, by the way, let me just make this very clear. I'm the real AT, huh? That's number one. Number two, Andrew Tate just became a Muslim. Sahih. He just became a Muslim. Oh, do, does anyone object now, huh? We've seen these tweets going around. If he becomes a Muslim, I'm going to leave the religion of Islam. A'udhu Billah. By some of the liberal feminists. Did you know, my brothers and my sisters, that some of the f companions, they used to be murderers? Did you guys know that? They used to be murderers. They used to murder people. Female companions, they would go and do tawaf around the Kaaba. Imagine that. No, don't imagine it. Huh? They would be doing tawaf around the Kaaba naked. When they embraced Al Islam, did anyone say to them, no, you can't become a Muslim? I became a Muslim. Right? And it was accepted from them. Andrew Tate likewise became a Muslim. Right? And sometimes he still says certain things that are in contrary against Al Islam. But he's a reefer. Right? If you ask me now, should we go and seek knowledge from him? Come on, guys. Like, it's like you're asking me, Mr. John, huh? Just became a Muslim and then he called himself Yaqub. Right? Are you going to start taking knowledge from Yaqub, guys? We go to seek knowledge and take knowledge from the people of speciality. Does that make sense? Right? May Allah Azza wa Jal release him from his troubles. Right? He's our Muslim brother. And they're trying to frame him, and it's not surprising. It really, really isn't. The moment you become a Muslim, they try to deal with you in this manner. Have you guys heard of Loon? Loon, you guys know Loon? Who used to do music videos with P. Diddy? Back in the day, some of you millennials don't know what I'm talking about. The elders do. Loon, when he became a Muslim, because they realized how influential he was, they began to dig up some of the things that may have happened a very, very long time ago. I, does that make sense, guys? The more a one becomes more influential, the more they start coming after him. So, oh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a random brother. May Allah guide him. May Allah better his Islamic understanding. Yeah? Naam. There is some good that he says, but it might be very difficult for someone who himself doesn't know basic Islamic principles to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong. Yeah? Huh. Does that answer your question? Yeah, go on. One follow-up, that's it. Uh. So, again, like, when you said um, that one sister came up to you, why do you talk about this bad part of our religion, right? So how do we talk back to these people and show them the good and the benefit for them? Akhi, she's the one that's seeing it in that subjective way. Not everything that you might see to be bad is actually bad. Does that make sense? A lot of these people who speak like that, they have a problem with submission, which is the core of Al-Islam. What is Al-Islam? Al-Islam lillahi bi tawheed. I am a slave of Allah, right? He is my Lord. Haythun qeed in qad. Wherever I'm turned to, I go. You know, sometimes we say, what does Islam say about abortion? What does Islam say about this? What does Islam say about that? It makes it appear as if Islam is a person, is a body. Don't tell me what does it say, what does Allah say? Can you see how the dynamics change? How the way we look at it completely changes? Allah said this, are you not his slave? Didn't he now bring you into existence? You are his servant and you are being commanded and instructed. How many a time, my brothers and my sisters, right? How many a time do we come across an article that medically proves what Allah said maybe 1400 years ago that he sent down in the Quran? Recently, recently guys, I came across this article on the Daily Mail again. Daily Mail has done me good for the last couple of weeks. The article stated, bacon and alcohol increase stomach cancer risk. Bacon and alcohol increase stomach cancer risk. Someone may say, oh, why is alcohol haram? Why is bacon and pork haram? Sometimes, Right? We are told the wisdom behind why it's haram. And sometimes you're not. And simply it should be what? Allah said so, and that's it. Does that make sense? But now when this article comes out, oh wow, subhanAllah. We don't need some non-Muslim guy to write us an article to make us feel like what Allah said is actually truth. Does that make sense, guys? 1400 years after this came out, hey, now you're going to believe? 
الآن وقد عصيت قبل ما كنت من المفسدين ها even recently سبحان الله I came across an article I think it was on BBC do you guys have BBC here ما شاء الله the article stated that it has been medically proven that when drinking you should sit down and how they want to now impose this into sports ها يا جماعة do we need some non-Muslim guy to prove this to us when the Prophet said this 1400 years ago? Right. You guys know the hadith of إِذَا وَقَعَ الْدُبَابُ فِي شَرَابِ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلِيَغْمِسْهُ ثُمَّ لِيَنْزِعُ فَإِنَّ فِي أَحَدِ جَنَاحِهِ دَاءَ وَالْأُخْرَ فِيهِ شِفَاءَ صحيح? What happens if you have this water? Or you have this water? Huh? <laughs> if a fly drops into this, what did the Messenger of tell you? Huh? You have to dip the other side. Someone may say, ah, oh, yucky, that's disgusting. That doesn't fall in line with my logic. As the time went on, it was medically proved that this is actually true. Does that make sense, guys? We are Muslims. The religion of Islam is the religion of truth. Right? Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala, he said, نحن أمتنا عزنا الله بالإسلام We are a people that have been honored through Islam. وَمَهْمَ بْتَغَيْنَا غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ هَذَلَّنَ اللَّهِ The moment we desire other than Islam, Allah will humiliate us. It is Umar al-Khattab رضي الله تعالى عنه that Allah عز و جل gave honor to the Muslims, right? When the Muslims were in hiding, he came out and said to the prophets, O Messenger of Allah, أَلَسْنَا عَلَى الْحَقِّ وَهُمْ عَلَى الْبَاطِلِ Right? Aren't we upon the truth? And they're upon falsehood? Right? And our martyrs are in Jannah and theirs are in the hellfire. God, let's go out. Let's be open about our religion. Right? First command, uh, was it? First amendment. Oh, we're saying, Akhi, this is my religion? And this is what you believe? Lakum deenakum wal yadeen. Right? It's as simple as that. Oh. Ah, Sheikh. I love the way you did your turban, Sheikh. Mm. In, in, in America, that you guys have one type, and that the predominant Hulu here is with the dua, meaning not, it wasn't between being extreme and being liberal, but that you guys have have one thing that's predominant over there, and the, the, the Hulu that's here is between the dua, and it's kind of like the elephant in the room. And how do you deal with the differences between the dua that restrict us from interacting with these people? For being Apple Sunnah al Jamaah, because that's the issue here. I get. Sheikh, I gave a whole lecture on it today in Masjid Ashab al Yameen. Ten points. And we discussed it in a lot of detail. The issue boils down to lack of understanding to what the usul are and what the furu' are. Right? You guys have the same belief, but you differ on subsidiary issues. Why should you now cause disunity and discord amongst the Muslims over issues that we should be tolerant about? Again, it goes back to knowledge. I, re I really, really believe that this became widespread in the UK and in many places here, especially maybe in places like Philly and New Jersey, right? Because you had people who did not learn the Arabic language properly, who didn't have the ability to read books and to study proficiently amongst the scholars, they started opening up certain translations which they completely took out of context. Does that make sense? And again, it all boils down to lack of knowledge. Everything we talked about, guys, it boils down to what? Lack of knowledge. And I've proven that to you guys. Huh? Oh yeah, well, we forgot about the sisters. There has to be equal rights here, guys. Huh? If the sisters have any questions, please bring it forward. Because I'm about to switch off in a moment. Like, guys, that nine hours in the, in the, in the airport, you know, really, had a toll on me. But alhamdulillah, seeing all of these faces, you know. I spent nine hours in Philly Airport, guys. Huh? So I didn't, I didn't take anything on from that side. Of like of like the Quran, right? Or the Sirah or 
Good. 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 أول واجب على العبيد معرفة الرحمن بالتوحيد. As the poet says, the first wajib, the first obligation upon an individual is knowing the rights of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala upon you. Right. And here we're speaking about the tawheed, Islamic monotheism, making sure that you're singling out Allah Azza wa Jalla accordingly. Right. There's a wonderfully written book called Kitab al-Tawheed. I don't agree with everything that's inside of the kitab. There are some weak hadith. But the way he breaks it down is just ayah hadith. He brings a chapter heading, and then he brings a verse, and then he brings a hadith. Put the explanation to the side for a moment. Just look at that, read it. And then maybe find an explanation to it. Pertaining to singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship. Learning likewise fiqh. Right? Learning fiqh. There are certain chapters of fiqh, my brothers and my sisters, that are essential, and that is because we are involved in it on a day-to-day -day basis, like Tahara, Salah, Ramadan's around the corner. We have to learn about fasting. You can't expect to do acts of worship and you don't know. Does that make sense? You don't know what you're getting yourself involved in. You have to learn it. We're not going to say to you that Hajj is a must upon you to learn up until it becomes an obligation upon you. Or you're on your way now to Hajj, you have to learn it. Right? You're not a businessman. I'm not going to tell you sit down and start learning about buying and selling if you're not going to be involved. Did you know, my brothers and my sisters, as Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu is narrated in Tirmidhi, right? He would say, لا يبع في سوقنا إلا من تفقها في الدين. One should not trade in our markets unless he has learned his religion. Who can tell me the reason why? Huh? Sorry? He said they take your money. <laughs> huh? Good. Our brother here mentioned, if you're having transactions and you don't have the knowledge, you might end up bringing haram into the markets. You bring riba into the markets. It is haram free, and now you're going to bring that into there. Right? There are things that we are directly involved with which we have to learn about. Learn a madhab. Take a madhab and use that now to study fiqh. Whether maybe Hanafi madhab, whether maybe the Shafi'i or the Hanbali or the Maliki Madhab. Start up with that studying the different chapters of fiqh. Does that make sense? Seerah learning it as well, it's good. Aqeedah likewise. But if you want to be serious and seek knowledge, my brothers and my sisters, as Imam al nawi rahmatullahi alayhi mentions, if you learn these two, it opens up all of the other sciences. Arabic and the Quran. Memorizing the Book of Allah, this will put barakah in the rest of your studies and then learning the Arabic language, right? So you don't have to constantly depend on people to translate for you. How would you address the children about the LGBTQ community without being offensive? You don't have to insult anyone. Right? You don't have to insult anyone. My religion, or Allah told me in the Quran, إِنَّكُمْ لَتَأْتُونَ الْفَاحِشَةَ مَا سَبَقَكُمْ بِهَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ Again, I'm just quoting. I don't have any views and opinions, guys. Allah is saying, وَلُوطًا إِذْ قَالَ لِقَوْمِهِ When Lord said to his people, أَتَأْتُونَ الْفَاحِشَةَ you carry out these immoral practices. No one ever preceded you in this. This was mentioned in the Quran. From the time of Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, guys. Huh? From the time of Adam and Eve, all the way up until they came along. <coughs> Imagine this, my brothers and sisters. The two times in history where this became widespread was in the time of Lot and in today's day and age. I. This is Islam, you know. It's, I have a video on my YouTube channel. Please do refer to it. What's your 
Okay, I'm going to give it to you guys. It's called Abu Taymiyyah. <laughs> One of the videos on there is called The Hidden LGBTQ and Pedophile Files. I'm not saying that they, I'm not, I'm not saying all of that. I'm just giving you guys a title. And the video hasn't been taken down. Because I abide by YouTube guidelines. <laughs> huh? I put the disclaimer right at the beginning. Inshallah ta'ala, it will be very insightful. Where I brought out a lot of studies carried out by, I think, the OCD. Is that what you guys call them? The CDC. CDC. Not OCD, guys, no. <laughs> I think they're like the health department or whatever. Wallahi, it took a lot of digging up to find articles of them saying that some of these practices are actually harmful for your health. So I just read it. All right? And I've got a lot of stuff on my YouTube channel pertaining to that. Please do refer to that, inshallah ta'ala. Just teaching them, look, we, as Muslims, right, have A and Z, right? This is our religion, and this is what we believe as Muslims. Again, for the millionth time, that doesn't mean we're going to start insulting or being offensive towards them. La. Right? You want to do this or you want to do that, you're in a democratic country. Go do what you want. And let me do what I want. Right? If women are allowed to work in Islam, then why are you advocating them not to? Did I say that, guys? No. <laughs> Can't make it loud so they can hear. Did I say that, brothers? No. Type. I made it, in fact, crystal clear that a woman can actually go out if there's a need for it. And I have a lecture on my YouTube channel, it's called The Problem with Feminism. And I spoke about the status of women, right, in Al Islam. Right? If there's a need for her to work, if my wife said to me she wants to work in this Islamic environment where she's maybe catering for huh, children, what, as long as she's not going to be negligent with regards to her duties at home and with her husband, go. No problem. However, if she's going to be the personal assistant of the boss, huh, then I've got a problem with that. And I think everyone here is going to have a problem with that. Agreed? Huh? She's walking around in heels, huh? dressing up a certain way, being the personal assistant of Big Boss. There are certain jobs and roles that is just not befitting. Agreed? And I don't think anyone with a mustard grain of protective jealousy would feel comfortable with that. How to deal with anger issues with my mom. Why are you guys laughing? <laughs> guys, wallahi, I'm, I, I want to give every question it's, it's, due, it's due haq, it's right. But because we've got a lot, I'm just going to... And this is why I thank Allah Azza wa Jal that these videos were recorded. Right? This video on my channel is called Seven Ways um, to Overcome Angra or something like that. Seven Ways. Just type in seven ways, anger, Abu Taym and it should come up. Some of these questions are getting dangerous. <laughs> How to seek Islamic knowledge while also memorizing Quran and doing uni in a way that isn't overwhelming? Just schedule out your day. Have a timetable. Every day I'm going to do this at this time. I am a disbeliever, guys, in, wait for it, huh? <laughs> I am a disbeliever in someone saying that there is not enough time in the day. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. There is always time. Go to your settings and check your screen time. I don't know anything about Galaxy Samsung, guys. I'm a loyal Apple fan. Huh? Go to the screen time and see how much time you're spending on Instagram, on WhatsApp, and all these other social media apps. Huh? And I'm sure you can make some sacrifices. You need discipline. You can get things done. And this is common sense. Nothing comes of ease, guys. Ask the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo, Elon Musk. Huh? You guys heard of these two personalities? You guys know about soccer? Huh? 
Cristiano Ronaldo, look at all the sacrifices he's made now to become, well, it's debatable as to whether he's top or not. Huh? Achy, the guy doesn't eat like everyone else. You guys seen what happened when he took Coca-Cola off the table, right? How this affected a big company like Coca-Cola? Millions of dollars they lost out just because he moved it like that. He makes sacrifice, he's disciplined. Right? Excuse me for using this as an example, but people like, you know, even Elon Musk, I think I came across, I think it was seven days that he mentioned one time in his tweet. Seven days a week he would be disciplined Right? And he would put in 16 hours a day. And it's not surprising that he's now, and I'll put this in quote, successful in what he does. This is not ultimate success. Hmm? It requires discipline, it requires hard work. You're going to have eye bags. You're going to get tired and exhausted. Does that make sense? You're going to have to put in the work. It may well be that you sacrifice a little bit on your sleep. You know, Ah, one from the brothers now. We took like five from the sisters. Get the guy all the way at the back. Next to the lift. What do you guys call it? The elevator. elevator. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. However, now there are secular studies as well. There's computer science. My roommate was from Namibia. Right? He was doing computer science alongside Islamic studies here and there. No. But it's mainly, yeah, no. Islamic studies. Huh? Is there, is there a from the well, like they accept a good chunk of them, you know? Well, at the same time? In Al Medina, no. It's only one. Unless you do something maybe online elsewhere and then you're doing it at the same time. But there, when you start the university, they will only give you a scholarship for one degree. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'll take two more questions. One from the sisters and one from the brothers. Equal rights, guys. <laughs> Okay, that, that kid over there who keeps waving like that, go on. Stand up, stand up. With that. No, no, not you, not the one next to him. <laughs> yeah, look it up. Strong what? What was that supposed to mean? Huh? Oh, discipline. They say motivation gets you going and discipline keeps you going. Right? <clears throat> you know, I have, a, I have a lecture on my YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's called 10 Steps to Learning the Arabic Language, okay? In it, I mention points that keeps you going with regards to learning the Arabic language. I know you've, you'll probably ask me a general question. One of, them, one of the points is to constantly ask yourself, why are you doing this? You have to have goals and objectives. My goal is to get to Jannah and I need to keep doing X, Y, and Z. All right? So please refer to that, because your boy is about to... Huh? Pass out. Well, like guys, I, 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 you know, we drove from Virginia in the morning. Fajr. I thought I would sleep before the event that I had in West Orange. But then I said, you know what, I'll sleep after. And I gave the lecture, and then the Q&A just dragged on. I said, if I sleep now, I'm going to miss this event. They told me it's 45 minutes away. I won't lie, guys, I'm about to switch off. You can probably look at my face. I look like a zombie, huh? One from the sisters. So is this from the sisters or brothers? Sorry, brother. <laughs> yeah. Let me take one from the sisters.
Okay, this one's a bit of a dangerous one, guys, yeah? So I'm going to protect myself by quoting Simone de Beauvoir. <laughs> one second, guys, one second. This might get me into a little bit of trouble. Taib, a sister has asked, Guys, wait for it. Calm down. What does Islam say about women taking on leadership positions in organizations such as MSA, Islamic organizations, and etc.? First and foremost, my brothers and my sisters, the Messenger Sallallahu said in a hadith, and I'm just quoting again, guys, لا يفلح قوم ولهم امرأة. A group of people that are run by a woman, they won't be successful. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. طيب, look what, Demont, look what Simone de Beauvoir says. In her book called Second Sex, she declares that there are biological qualities that affect a woman's diligence. The founding mother of feminism is saying this. Right? With all that which she stands for, sometimes you look at some of her writings and it's really, really contradictory. Right? Look what she says, right? Her grasp of the world is thus more limited. She has less firmness and perseverance in projects that she is also less able to carry out. This means that her individual life is not as rich as a man's one. Right? So I'm reading this as Deb of what is saying that women are intrinsically more emotionally unstable and weak willed than I am. That's her saying this in a nutshell, guys. All right. I think you may have your answer. <laughs> huh? Our brother, he said, <laughs> the New Zealand Prime Minister resigned. She was a woman, and then she resigned. Also, have you guys heard of the uh, female Prime Minister that we had in the UK? What was her name? No, the one recent one. What was her name again? No, not Liz Truss. Oh, yeah, Liz Truss. How long did she stay in power for? Was it two weeks or was it four weeks? Two weeks, guys. The one before her. No, brother, the brother before, there was this other lady who really hated Islam and she would give them a lot of trouble. Theresa May. Fatahallahu alaik. Aye, Fatahallahu alaik. Wallahi al my brothers and my sisters, she was grilled so much, she just couldn't take the heat. The emotions started getting into the way, right? You could see, subhanAllah, from her eyes and everything, the way he was having a toll on her. Of course, this has a toll on just about any individual who's prime minister. However, these are just some examples. But like I said, the Prophet said so. Right? The Prophet said so. And I'm just quoting what Simone de Beauvoir, the founding mother of feminism from France, mentioned. There are biological differences, my brothers and my sisters. Some roles befit someone or one over the other. One last one from the brothers and we're done, guys. Ini, mini, mini. Go on, go on. I don't think there's a contradiction. And I have a problem, my brothers and my sisters, between, I have a problem with this world balancing out deen and dunya. I don't feel comfortable, I'm gonna, I'm, and I'm going to tell you guys. You normally would balance between two things that are equal to one another, right? So when someone says balance, I don't feel comfortable. Having said that, guys, like I said before, I may disbelieve in someone who says, I don't have enough time. You can find time in your day to even do a little bit alongside your university studies. Does that make sense? Seeking knowledge is one of the best forms of ibadah. 
Even Imam Ahmed rahmatullahi alayhi says there's nothing better than seeking knowledge in sahati niyyah. If your intentions are correct. Does that make sense, guys? So you're going to find time. All right. As busy as I am, I'm still trying to do my qiraat. Huh? I'm super busy. I have to read to my teacher tomorrow. I don't know how I'm going to do it because it's going to be at 5 a.m. UK time. Sorry, it's going to be 5 a.m. US time. While it's over there at 10 a.m. I have to make the effort. So you got to continue. You can see, looking at me now, right? I'm about to what? Huh? Collapse. We have to, right? Brothers, wallahi, and sisters, sisters, may Allah bless you guys. Honestly, don't take it the wrong way. I'm your brother, and I care a lot about you guys. I care for your well-being, and I care for everyone else's well-being as well from the brothers here. Al-Islam is so perfect. If we want to be happy, we abide by the laws of the Creator. He who created happiness, right? He who created happiness in comparison to a lot of these non-Muslims are unhappy even though they have all the materialistic things. Right. May Allah bless you all for, uh, for filling the house of Allah Azza wa Jal. And if Allah doesn't reunite us in this dunya, may Allah reunite us in the air after. Zakallah khair. Brothers, inshallah, we're going to pray Aisha now. Inshallah, brothers, we're going to pray Aisha now. We're going to pray Aisha now. So we're going to call the Adhan, then call the Iqamah and pray Aisha. So please, brothers, whoever needs to take wudu, go take wudu downstairs. We're going to pray Aisha now. And if there's no room, please, there's room downstairs. Jazakumullah khair. Are you the Imam Sheikh? Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله الصلاة حي على الصلاة الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله
الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استو استو تراسو إزرون Inshallah ta'ala, my beloved brothers and sisters, I'm going to be reading with the riwayah Khalaf and Hamza. It's one of the different variations and recitations of the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down upon his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahu Akbar. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين عما يتسالون عن النبأ العظيم الذي هم فيه مختلفون كلا سيعلمون ثم كلا سيعلمون ألم نجعل الأرض مهادا والجبال أوتادا وخلقناكم أزواجا وجعلنا نومكم سباتا وجعلنا الليل لباسا وجعلنا النهار معاشا وبنينا فوقكم سبعا شدادا وجعلنا سراجا وهاجا وأنزلنا من المعصرات ماء ثجاجا لنخرج به حبا ونباتا وجنات ألفافا إن يوم الفصل كان ميقاتا يوم ينفخ في الصور فتأتون أفواجا وفتحت السماء فكانت بوابا وسيرت الجبال فكان السرابا إن جهنم كانت مرصادا للطاغين مابا لبثين فيها أحقابا لا يذوقون فيها بردا ولا شرابا إلا حميما وغساقا جزاء وفاقا إنهم كانوا لا يرجون حسابا وكذبوا بآياتنا كذابا وكل شيء إن أحصيناه كتابا فذوقوا فلن نزيدكم إلا عذابا إن للمتقين مفازا الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله 
الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين جزاء وفاقا إنهم كانوا لا يرجون حسابا وكذبوا بآياتنا كذابا وكل شيء إن أحصيناه كتابا فذوقوا فلن نزيدكم إلا عذابا إن للمتقين مفازا حدائق وأعنابا وكواعب أترابا وكأسا دهاقا لا يسمعون فيها لغوا ولا كذابا جزاء من ربك عطاء حسابا رب السماوات والأرض وما بينهما الرحمن لا يملكون منه خطابا يوم يقوم الروح والملائكة صفا لا يتكلمون لا يتكلمون إلا من أذن له الرحمن وقال صوابا ذلك اليوم الحق فمن شيء اتخذ إلى ربه مابا إنا أنذرناكم عذابا قريبا يوم ينظر المرء ما قدمت يداه ويقول الكافر يا ليتني كنت ترابا الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم brothers Brothers, I want to hug and kiss every single one of you guys. But as you guys can see, I'm really, really exhausted. I don't think I did a Q&A like this anywhere else. And you guys grilled me for it, and I'm mentally now exhausted. So please bear that in mind, inshallah ta'ala. Honestly, I feel very, very weak. I would like to hug and shake the hands of every single one of you guys. Wallahi, guys, I don't think it's convenient. May Allah bless you all, inshallah ta'ala. Barakallah feekum, wa ahsanallahu ilaykum. Assalamu alaikum. So, uh, brothers and sisters, so I, I, I am from Chicago, Illinois. So, there is a Muslim organization with special needs. So, inshallah, please support mohsin.org. www.mohsin.org. I am a brother with special needs. So, inshallah, please support mohsin.org. 
Jo ja cal que hagin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can I get the brothers' attention for one second? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We need your attention one second. Brother wants to make an announcement. Jazakallah khair. Please respect him. This uh, announcement will be very quick. We need to vacate the area because there's going to be a salah at 8 o'clock. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Inshallah, I'm a brother with special needs, so I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Inshallah, please support Mohsin.org. www.mohsin.org. Jazakallah khairan. Okay, please vacate the area. Jazakallah khairan. I'm going to 